epistle of Polycarp to the Philippians. Now, I'm going to read this to you. This is, um, you'll have a link down below in the description box uh, to our site where you can download the PDF, which is not written. With Chapter 1. I have greatly rejoiced with you in our Lord Jesus Christ because you have followed the example of true love and have accompanied, as became you, those who were bound in chains, the fitting commandments of saints, and which are indeed the diadems of the true elect of God and our Lord. And because of the strong root of your faith, spoken of in days long gone by, endureth even until now, and brings forth fruit unto our Lord Jesus Christ, who, for our sins, suffered even unto death. For God raised from the dead, having loosed the bands of the grave, in whom, through now, you see him not, you believe, and believing rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, unto which joy many desire to enter, knowing that by grace you are saved, not of works, but by the will of God through Jesus Christ. Okay, right there, you know, I'm sure many who listen will say, okay, see, it's not of works, grace you are saved, um, so there's nothing you have to do. Jesus did it all for you. It's all been paid, past, present, and future. You're always going to mess up. So even though you're trying not to sin, you're going to sin. You're just going to keep sinning. You're just going to be a big mess up and a big lump of mess up until you receive your glorified bodies or you go to heaven, some, whatever, whatever some people believe. Now, is that true? Is that true? Let's continue on in this epistle because, you know, he says, by grace you are saved, not of works, but by the will of God. Well, as we move forward, he explains what that means. Now, this is not going to be very popular to many people who are listening to this because right there they kind of cut their brain off and say, okay, I get that, and then they kind of just drift through the rest of the epistle. But remember, there were no chapters and verses. These were just one long letter. So let's keep reading along. Chapter 2. Wherefore, girding up your loins, serve the Lord in fear and truth as those who have forsaken the vain, empty talk and error of the multitude, and believed in him who was raised up, who raised up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, and gave him glory and a throne at his right hand. To him all things in heaven and earth are subject. Him every spirit serves. He comes as the judge of the living and the dead. His blood will God require of those who do not believe in him. But he who raised him up from the dead will raise up us also if we do his will and walk in his commandments and love what he loved, keeping ourselves from all righteousness, cov- all unrighteousness, I'm sorry, covetousness, love of money, evil speaking, false witness, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing or blow for blow or cursing for cursing, but being mindful what the Lord said in his teaching, judge not that ye not be judged. Forgive and it shall be forgiven unto you. Be merciful that you may obtain mercy and what measure you meet it shall be measured to you again. And once more, Blessed are the poor and those that are persecuted for the righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So you see, my friends, he does not say that you don't have to do anything. Jesus paid it all for you. He died on the cross for your sins so that when you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. You're going to keep messing up. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. Let's listen to this again. He says, If he'll raise us up from the dead, as he raised Jesus from the dead also, if we do his will and walk in his commandments and love what he loved, keeping ourselves from all unrighteousness, covetousness, love of money, evil speaking, false witness, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, or blow for blow, or cursing for cursing, but being mindful of what the Lord said in his teaching, judge not that you'll be not judged, 
forgiven, it shall be forgiven to you. Be merciful, and you shall obtain mercy. What measure that you mete out, it shall be measured to you again. I hope you follow that. That's very important. It does not say, when you do not, when you sin, God does not impute your sin to you. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that at all. Where does that come from? That's not in the scripture. It's not what, certainly not what John taught. And Polycarp learned under John. And John learned directly under Jesus. So where does that stuff come from? You have to ask yourself. That's not what he's saying here. Not at all. You know, that's, that's, and I'm not saying this to say, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, blah, blah, blah. No. I'm saying this because this is the truth. This is what is. Listen to what's being taught now. Listen to be what's being said in churches all across the United States, all over the world. They're preaching a gospel that was never taught, never, by the early Christians, by the fathers, by Jesus Christ himself. Was not, was not taught. And you have to ask yourself, why? Chapter 3. These things, brethren, I write to you concerning righteousness, nor not because I take anything upon myself, but because you have invited me to do so. For neither I nor any other such one can come up to you, can come up to the wisdom of the blessed and glorified Paul. He, when among you, accurately and steadfastly taught the word of truth in the presence of those who were then alive. And when absent from you, he wrote you a letter which if you carefully study, you will find to be the means of building you up in that faith which has been given you and which being followed by hope and preceded by love towards God and Christ and our neighbor is the mother of us all. For if anyone be inwardly possessed of these graces, he hath fulfilled the commandment of righteousness since he that hath love is far from all sin. So you see, my friends, what he's saying there. He is not saying that you're, that Paul was a Roman's wretch and struggled with sin until the day he died. No, he does not say that. He says, with the wisdom of the blessed and glorified Paul, when he was among you, accurately and steadfastly taught the word of truth in the presence of those who were alive. He taught righteousness. Right in there he says, These things, brethren, I write to you concerning righteousness. Paul didn't, didn't teach Romans wretch, sin unto, you know, I'm evil. No, he did not say that. That was written, if you read Romans chapter 6 and 8, it's blatantly obviously that's not, Paul's not talking of himself in chapter 7. He's speaking, um, in the historic present, which I would ask you to Wikipedia search that, or actually I'll put a link in the bottom to, so you can understand what the historic present is. And most books, movies, and um, even the Gospels are written in the historic present. But be that as it may, let's continue on. But this is obvious. It is quite obvious by this epistle right here as we go forward. That being a sinner, saved by grace, sinning every day in thought, word, and deed, past, present, and future, sins forgiven. Jesus paid it all for you. God doesn't see you. He sees Jesus, etc., etc. Imputed righteousness, uh, transfer of righteousness. You don't see any of that stuff written here. Well, again, ask yourself, why? Where did it come from? Chapter 4. But the love of money is the root of all evils, knowing, therefore, that as we brought nothing into the world, so we can carry nothing out. Let us arm ourselves with the armor of righteousness, and let us teach, first of all, ourselves to walk in the commandments of the Lord. Next, your wives, in the faith given to them, and in love and in purity, tenderly loving their own husbands in all truth, and loving all equally in all chastity, and to train up their children in the knowledge and fear of God. Teach the widows to be discreet as respects the faith of the Lord, praying continually for all, being far from all slandering. 
evil speaking, false witnessing, love of money, and every kind of evil, knowing that they are the altar of God, that he clearly perceives all things, and that nothing is hid from him, neither reasonings, nor reflections, nor any of the secret things of the heart. Wow, how powerful is that? He's saying that don't do any of that stuff and teach your wives and your kids and the widows to keep themselves pure. He doesn't say that tell the wives, kids, you know, that, that Jesus did it all for you and that, the, and, that, and that, you know, do the best you can, but when you mess up, you have. he does not say that. Doesn't. He says nothing is hid from God, nothing. No, your reasonings, nor your reflections, no other, no secret in your heart can be hidden. So what does that say? That God doesn't see you, he sees Jesus? No, it does not say that. Please, wake up. Wake up and again ask yourself, where does that stuff come from? And why are these guys teaching that? Or late women too. Why are they teaching this stuff? It's not in the Bible. It's made up. Chapter 5. Knowing then that God is not mocked, we ought to walk worthy of his commandment and glory in like manner should the deacons be blameless before the face of his righteousness as being the servants of God and Christ and not of men. They must not be slanderers, double-tongued, or lovers of money, but temperate in all things, compassionate, industrious, walking according to the truth of the Lord, who was the servant of all. If we please him in this present world, we shall receive also the future world according as he has promised to us that he will raise us again from the dead and that we, if we live worthily of him, we shall also reign together with him, provided only we believe. In the like manner, let the young men also be blameless in all things, being especially careful to preserve purity and keeping themselves in as with a bride from every kind of evil. For it is well that they should be cut off from the lusts that are in the world, since every lust warreth against the Spirit, and neither fornicators, nor effeminates, nor abusers of themselves with mankind shall inherit the kingdom of God, nor those who do things inconsistent and unbecoming. Wherefore, it is needful to abstain from all these things, being subject to the presbyters and deacons unto God and Christ. The virgins also must walk in a blameless and pure conscience. So you see, my friends here, he does say belief. He says, provided only we believe. But he says you have to do all these things. See, I say it in many videos. We say it, Mike, everybody said it. You don't believe that Christ can empower you to do these things. And you certainly don't believe you can do these things. You don't believe in that your heart can be pure. You don't believe that your mind could be free of evil thoughts. You don't, or to dwell on evil thoughts. Temptations are of the world. Yeah, they're going to pass before your eyes. But they mean nothing to you. They mean nothing to a washed, clean, regenerated, transformed Christian who has put on the mind of Christ and who walks as he walked. I don't hear anybody preaching that. I hear you don't have to do those things. You know, I, I come against the wrong repentance of people who try to stop sinning and keep the law. What? Where do you get this stuff from? I don't understand where you think, what you think you're getting away with just because you have something you, you see what's written in the scriptures clearly you hear what's written in this letter clearly yet your mind and your actions are contrary to what you're reading so what happens you you form this dissonance in your mind that says well one of them has to be wrong so you start making excuses you start justifying your behaviors 
And how do you justify your behaviors? Well, God doesn't see me. He sees Jesus. Well, Jesus paid it all for me. His blood covers my sins. I don't have to do anything. It's all been done. I can't add, I can't add to anything more than what Jesus did. I can't, walk, I can't walk as he walked. I'm not worthy to do that. I'm just a Roman's wretch. I'm a rotten sinner saved by grace. Do you see how foolish that is? Right here, he's telling us we ought to walk worthy of his commandments. And then he says that we will be raised from the dead and that we will live, if we live worthily of him, we shall also reign with him. You see, it doesn't say he died and did it all for you and you're, you're saved, no one could take him, you're out of your hand, you're eternal salvation, you're an elect. It doesn't say any of that stuff. Why? Why would If that was the gospel of Christ, why wouldn't he preach it here? Was Polycarp like, just didn't understand that stuff? He was kind of like a, a, a reprobate Christian or, you know, he didn't have his degree. He wasn't uh, certified from... Uh, uh, you know, the, the Domini Dom Dominicans University or whatever they're called. Come on, guys. Think. Chapter 6. And let the presbyters be compassionate and merciful to all, bringing back those who wander, visiting all the sick, not neglecting the widow, the orphan, or the poor, but always providing for that which is becoming in the sight of God and men, abstaining from all wrath, res uh, abstaining from respect of persons and unjust judgment, keeping far from covetousness, not quickly crediting against anyone or, sir or judging anyone, not serve in judgment as knowing that we are all under a debt of sin. If then we entreat the Lord to forgive us, we ought also ourselves to forgive, for we are before the eyes of our Lord and God, and we must all appear at the judgment seat of Christ, and must everyone give account of himself. Let us then serve him in fear and with all reverence, even as he himself has commanded us, and as the apostles who preached the gospel unto us and the prophets who proclaimed beforehand the coming of the Lord, let us be zealous in the pursuit of that which is good, keeping ourselves from causes and offense, from false brethren, and from those who in hypocrisy bear the name of the Lord and draw away vain men unto error. Wow, there's a lot there to unpack, huh? You know, he says in there, you know, you, you know, with your uh, professed Christian ears, you hear, knowing that we are all under a debt of sin. See, we're all under the debt of sin. No, it says, if then we entreat the Lord to forgive us, he also must forgive us, but we have to do our part. Let us then serve him in fear with all reverence, even as he himself commanded us. Right? The apostles who preached the gospel unto us, they didn't preach sin every day in thought, word, and deed. And the prophets who proclaimed before the coming of the Lord, let us be zealous in pursuit of that which is good. No, no one is good. No, not one. You see? Keeping ourselves from the causes of offense, from false brethren, and from those who in hypocrisy bear the name of the Lord. What, is, what did Jesus say? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. It means saying, what is hypocrisy? Saying one thing and doing another. I have a video on, on there, I'll, you know, if you want to look it up, it's called, you know, churches are pre preaching, uh, Christian churches are preaching Satanism. They are. Because what did Jesus call the Pharisees, the sons of the devil? Because they're hypocrites. That's why. And then there's, there, there's a gentleman in there, I think his name is Ed Young. He has a big church in Texas or somewhere in the South, and he has all preaches a whole sermon on being proud to be a hypocrite. I mean, what? What are these people teaching? What are they preaching? Thousands of people are cheering, saying, yeah, I'm a hypocrite. What? When this says, don't be a hypocrite. 
when Christ says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. I don't understand it. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm blown away that anybody could cheer and, and amen that stuff. I mean, where are your minds? Where are your hearts? Chapter 7. For whosoever does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is antichrist. And whoever does not confess the testimony of the cross is of the devil. And whosoever perverts the oracles of the Lord to his own lusts and says that there is neither resurrection nor a judgment, he is the firstborn of Satan. Wherefore, forsaking the vanity of many and their false doctrines, let us return to the, let us return to the word which has been handed down from the beginning, watching unto prayer and preserving and fasting, beseeching in our supplication the all-seeing God, not to lead us into temptation, as the Lord has said. The spirit is truly willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, we see here something that I want to get into. We have people out there saying, see, all you have to do is be believe and receive and let God do the rest. Is that what this says? No. He says keeping ourselves, preserving ourselves. You have to do your part. Will Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, empower you to do these things? Absolutely yes. You're not going to be able to do them of and by yourself. No. It says, I do all things who Christ, through Christ who strengthens me. It is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Yes. But does that mean I just toss aside my... my, my, my uh, my brain and my will and just walk around like a jellyfish and do whatever I will and just and just kind of be possessed and guided. God doesn't possess you. The Holy Spirit doesn't possess anyone. It doesn't make you do anything. I mean, there's people out there who says, yeah, you know, you know, we receive the Spirit and I start doing this and I start doing that and it's, you know, I just do it. No, God is not going to take you and make you involuntarily do things. No, 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 absolutely not. Think of when he asked me to, well, when he commanded Moses to go talk, he said, no, nah, I don't want to do that. And he said, yeah, you're going to go do it. Don't worry, I'll put my words in your mouth. But you have to go do it. He didn't just like uh, grab Moses by the lapel and drag him kicking and screaming and, and, and start uttering, you know, uh, things to Pharaoh. Come on, man, wake up, wake up. That's not true. It doesn't happen that way. You have to be a willing participant. You are not a passive, bath, uh, passive bystander who's positionally right with Jesus. Come on. That is just the biggest pile of nonsense ever. You have to participate in this walk. It's a walk. And if you don't want to put your one foot forward from the other, you are not participating you will not inherit. That's just it. That's what he's saying here. He's not saying, sit in your chair and God's going to miraculously come down, push you out of your chair, push you out into the street and make you a Christian. Huh? Come on. Stop being silly. Stop making excuses. Let us then continually persevere in our hope and the earnest of our righteousness, which is Jesus Christ, who bore our sins in his own body on the tree, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, but endured all things for us, that we might live in him. Let us then be imitators of his patience, and if we suffer for his name's sake, let us glorify him, for he has set us this example in himself." And we have believed that such is the case. What beauty and unbelievable power are written in these few words. So what is, what is, what is he saying here? Polycarp is saying, let us then continually persevere in our hope and in the earnestness of our righteousness, which is Christ Jesus, right? He taught us his way. Our righteousness, from what we probably would have thought of our own, is washings, keeping of Sabbaths, doing all these rituals, 
which are meaningless, and they have nothing to do with righteousness. Jesus Christ taught us, came to this earth, and gave a radical message. Bless those who curse you. Love those who hate you. Treat those good who purposely abuse you. Where have you heard that preached? Have you ever heard that preached before by anybody? I don't think I, I, I know I have. I, you could look, you could write the writings of, uh, I studied all that crazy stuff, you know, when I was uh, before, you know, the existential Buddhism and the mind of Krishna and all this other nonsense. And all it does is just, it's just a, an ego trip is all it is. You know, you, 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 you ignore other people. You separate yourself from other people, but you're not love. There's no love there. There's no love for other people. You have, you know, so, you, know you, you get this like fuzzy, warm feeling, I guess, uh, and call it love. But love is loving your enemies. Love is giving your enemy a jacket. Love is to somebody ask you for one jacket, you give them two. Not sit there in the lotus position and stare at your navel. That's just not it. So as we continue here and here, we see... He says, for he set an example in himself that we who have believed that that such is the case. So what is he saying? He's saying he did it all for you so you could point at it and said, look, see what Jesus did? Amen. No, he didn't. He said he set an example that you walk in it, that we participate in it. I don't know, some of you are probably hung up or you're going to write nasty grams in the comment section, and I welcome them because it shows what's really in your heart. Chapter 9, I exhort you all, therefore, to yield obedience to the word of righteousness and to exercise all patience, such as ye have seen before your eyes, not only in the case of the blessed Ignatius and Zoesimus and Rufus, but also in others among yourselves and in Paul himself and the rest of the apostles. This do in the assurance that all these have not run in vain, but in faith and righteousness, and that they are in their due place in the presence of the Lord, with whom also they suffered. For they love not this present world, but him who died for us, and for our sakes was raised again by God from the dead. Chapter 10. Stand fast, therefore, in these things, and follow the example of the Lord, being firm and unchangeable in the faith, loving the brotherhood, and being attached to one another, joined together in the truth, exhibiting the meekness of the Lord in your intercourse with one another, and despising no one. When you can do good, defer it not, because alms delivers from death, be all of you subject to one another, having your conduct blameless among the Gentiles, that you may both receive praise for your good works, and the Lord may not be blasphemed through you. But woe to him by whom the name of the Lord is blasphemed. Teach, therefore, sobriety to all and manifest it in all of your conduct. Wow. That's pretty powerful right there. If that isn't clear enough for anybody listening to this as to what Christians do and what they're supposed to be doing and that they're not sinners saved by grace that sin every day in thought, word, and deed, and it doesn't say don't you don't have to do anything because Jesus did it all for you. It doesn't say say a simple sinner's prayer and you shall be saved. It doesn't say feel bad about your sin and you shall be saved. It doesn't say any of that doesn't say any of that it says in fact be all of you subject to one another having your conduct blameless among the gentiles that you may both receive praise from for your good works and the lord may not be blasphemed through you wow woe to him woe to that person by whom the name of the lord is blasphemed Teach, therefore, sobriety to all and manifest it also in your own conduct. Does that sound like God doesn't see you, he sees Jesus? Does that sound like you're always going to mess up 
And when you do, God doesn't see you. He sees Jesus. Is that what that says? I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand what you're following. Other than your own lusts, I was there. Not yelling at you, not screaming at you. I was there too. I believe that. St- well, I didn't believe that stuff, but I believe some other weird stuff too. I believe more in law keeping and all that other nonsense. But either way, I believed in substitution, that Jesus did it in, on our behalf, that he died and paid a sin debt. And what? Where does it say that? It doesn't say that. So that, so that you know, I, I, you know, I'm just a big floppy mess up, and he did that for me, and I, and I, and I just remain. I, I don't. There's no transformation. There's no purity of heart. There's no cessation from sin. I don't know. I don't see that anywhere here. Do you? Chapter eleven. I am greatly grieved for Valens who was once a presbyter among you, because he so little understands the place that was given him. I exhort you, therefore, that you abstain from covetousness, and that you be chaste and truthful. Abstain from every form of evil. For if a man cannot govern himself in such matters, how shall he, en- how shall he enjoin them on others? If a man does not keep himself from covetousness, He shall be defiled by idolatry and shall be judged as one of the heathen. But who of us are ignorant of the judgment of the Lord? Do we not know that the saints shall inherit the world as Paul teaches? But I have neither seen nor heard of any such thing among you in the midst of whom the blessed Paul labored and who we commended in the beginning of this epistle, for he boasts of you. In all those churches which alone then knew the Lord, but we had not yet known him. I am deeply grieved, therefore, brethren, for him, Valens, and his wife, to whom may the Lord grant true repentance. And be you then moderate in regard to this matter, and do not count such as enemies, but call them back as suffering and straying members, that you may save your whole body, for by acting, so for for by so acting, you shall edify yourselves. Again, this is a powerful chapter here. He says, abstain from every form of evil. Does that mean it's okay to do this? It's okay to do that? And if you do it, you know you're covered by the blood. You're covered by the, by the finished work, rather. Your debt's been paid. You see how foolish that is? And he says, how can you tell someone to do something when you yourself are guilty of the same thing? I mean, Paul says that again and again. I think it's in the book of Romans where he says, you know, you say not to covet. Do you covet? You say not to steal. Do you steal? You say not to lie. Do you lie? I mean, he says, do we not know that the saints shall judge the world? It says, it says, you know, if you can't keep yourself from that, you, you bring condemnation and shame to, to, the, to God. And you're going to be judged for it. You're, God doesn't look at you and see, and he, he rips out the pages of your book and puts in the pages of Jesus. Where does it say that? It does not. That's all a bunch of malarkey made up by men. And thousands and thousands and thousands of people buy into it. Again, ask yourself, why? For I trust that you are well versed in the sacred scriptures and that nothing is hid from you. But to me, this privilege is not yet granted. It is declared then in these scriptures, be ye angry and sin not, and let not the sun go down on your wrath. Happy is he who remembers this, which I believe to be the case with you. But may God and Father, may the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ himself, who is the Son of God and our everlasting high priest, fill you up in faith and truth and in all meekness, gentleness, patience, long-suffering, forbearance, and purity. And may he bestow on you a lot and portion among his saints and on us with you and on all that are under heaven who shall believe in our Lord Jesus Christ and in his Father 
who raised him from the dead. Pray for all the saints. Pray for kings and potentates and princes and for those that persecute and hate you and for the enemies of the cross that your fruit may be manifest to all and that you may be perfect in him. Both you and Ignatius wrote to me and if anyone, that if anyone went into Syria, he should carry your letter with him, which request I will attend to if I find a fitting opportunity, either personally or through some other, act, some other person acting for me, that your desire may be fulfilled. The epistle of Ignatius written to him, to us, and to the rest which we have by us, we have sent to you as you requested. They are subjoined to this epistle. And by them you may be greatly profited, for they treat of faith and patience and of all things that tend to edification of our Lord. Any more certain information you may have obtained respecting both Ignatius himself and those that were with him have goodness have the goodness to make known to us. Conclusion. These things I have written to you by Crescens, whom up to the present time I have recommended unto you and do now recommend, for he has acted blamelessly among us, and I believe also among you. Moreover, you will hold his sister in esteem when she comes to you. Be ye safe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you all. Amen. So, so you see, my friends, I rec highly recommend that you go to the link below and download the PDF. Actually, I would have recommended that you do that before you listen so you could read along uh, as, you know, my tongue and my readings are not the most professional or the greatest, but the whole idea is to get across the point, and I hope I did, that the current gospel, or whatever you want to call it, I, I call it the anti-gospel, that is being preached in churches or buildings. I don't even want to call them churches because churches are the called out ones. In buildings, denominational buildings and halls, and rooms, and YouTube, and across the world. It's being preached nonstop, 24-7, which is just the opposite of what we just read. They tell you, it doesn't matter what you do. It matters what's been done. Is that true? Did you read that? Did you hear that in this epistle? Do you read that in the Bible, really? Does it say... You shall be judged based on what Jesus did. Is that what the Bible says? I don't see that anywhere. Does it say that Jesus' righteousness is imputed to you? No. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say it's transferred to you. You can't transfer uh, you know, what you are. You transfer that. You know, you say, I'm a happy person. Let me transfer my happiness to you. No, you can't, you can't do that. It's just not done. And it's, it's silly because the Bible doesn't say that anyway. It says the grace is the empowerment and the teaching for us to live righteously, cleanly, clear before God and men in this present age so that when we come up in the judgment, and we will, every single one of us will be judged by our deeds and our words and our thoughts. Are you going to sit there before a holy and righteous God and say, well, my pastor told me I, I, it didn't matter what I did. It was what Jesus did. Do you really think you're going to get away with that? Do you really think that's going to work? I would have to think long and hard about that because when you read the scriptures from page 1, to the last page, it's all about choosing good over evil. It's a choice. And Jesus died. Why? He died as an example and a ransom. He freed us from the power of sin and death. Now, we have to pick up, and he showed us the way, right? Crucifixion, crucify the flesh. I'm not going to get into a big sermon here, but I just want you to read with these things in mind. Take your present understanding, take your lens, your, your professed Christian lens, your, your churchianity lens, and read this Polycarp 
epistle and see if that makes any sense. It can't, and it won't. And it'll probably be an offense to you, and you'll probably say, well, this isn't scripture anyway. What does it matter? Right? I know that's going to come out too. So I have nothing more to say uh, other than be well, and we will see you next time. Bye now.